when you're talking about I'm going to move from a, a path in life, I mean, a big path in life to another big path in life, um, it's, uh, it's something I didn't take lightly. And simply, um, you look at it, uh, I'm telling everybody I'm doing medicine and I'm, do, I'm working a job and I'm going to school for that and my, my parents are supporting that to telling everybody at that job I'm quitting. Um, I'm telling all my professors I'm moving to a different major in a different department and then telling my parents and my family that I'm not going to go to med school anymore, uh, that I'm going to live this life of adventure and intrigue in the music industry, <laughs> which is exactly a, you know, a path that you have to take alone. All right, welcome to The Path Distilled. I'm your host, Kevin Harris. My co-host is Lauren Tashman. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show today. And today we're so lucky to have Dr. Jeremy Tubbs. He's the Director of Music and Entertainment at the University of Memphis Lambeth Campus. Welcome to the show, Dr. Tubbs. Hey, thanks for having me. So could you tell us a little bit about uh, what you do in that role and kind of what your music background is? Absolutely. Um, this program at the University of Memphis Lambeth Campus is a kind of an interdisciplinary program. It's got many facets to it. So it's kind of like musical entrepreneurship in a way. Um, it's built around three different studies um, in life, uh, mu music, um, technology, and then the business side. Um, and so it's not, some people go to college to study just music. Some people go to college, you know, um, you know, to learn it, you know, to study music as like an instrument, like voice or violin or piano, like I did. I actually went to college and studied guitar performance. And um, some people go more into the technical uh, side of it. And so there's a degree, you know, music technology, and then there's a degree in music business, and they kind of choose from those. And what we decided to do is put our brains together and come up with a program that sort of uh, gives a little bit of the most important aspects of all three of those. So you get uh, music uh, and some type of study, whether it be an instrument or, or, or vocals or whatever, uh, a little bit of technology and a little bit of business. And, uh, you know, it builds like a, again, a more kind of broad balanced um, student there. So um, I kind of go back and, and say to students as they come into the program, if you really want to be into in the music production side of it, if you really want to sort of be in the technology side, then you should really get a degree in music technology. Um, but if you want a little bit of everything, uh, that's that's our purpose, you know, at this campus. And it, this this degree is not technically offered on the main campus, so you have to come to 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 uh, our campus to get that degree, which is also draws people to this area. Music, you know, musicians and people who want to work in the business. So it's, it's kind of feeding itself a little bit. Yeah. Sounds like an awesome program. Um, Thank you. So kind of take us back to uh, how you first got involved in music. Where was that beginning for you? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> 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 I, I, I really don't. Um, so my passion has always been, um, and <laughs> I think my mother uh, was the one who uh, probably dealt with me the most. My father was, you know, not as, um, um, he was supportive. I, I won't say that, but he, he, he definitely was, it took him longer to get on the, on, on the board, you know, on the ship here. Um, but my mother said that she noticed me going to a piano when I was, uh, four or five years old. I don't remember it. Um, I remember, I do remember the piano, of course, at a, much later though. Uh, but I, she said, I went to the piano, uh, at, four or five years old, and I started to play um, Christmas songs um, during a Christmas time, um, you know, 1980-ish is when uh, when this was. So I would go to, to the piano and, you know, play Jingle Bells, which is not difficult, but for four or five-year-old, it, it was pretty cool. Uh, it, you know, if my four or five-year-old did that, I would probably go, oh, <laughs> 
<laughs> the next Mozart. <laughs> what, what are we doing here? <laughs> so, um, it was it was fantastic because my mom recognized that right away, and she said, "Simply, you know, let's get him some lessons." But it took a, another year or two because they just felt my my parents felt I was too young to start some kind of uh, educational uh, music uh, journey, and um, uh, I was seven, and my mom simply said to me, would you like to uh, uh, play an instrument? And I said, of course, yes. And she goes, well, which instrument? And I said, drums. <laughs> it was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine a mother thinking a piano is a much better option than the drums. <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly what mom did. Mom said, uh, piano or guitar. And that's what really kind of, well, I see the guitar a lot more than the piano, you know, in my seven-year-old brain. So I, I said, yeah, a guitar would be great. And, you know, all I could think of is like the Muppet show, you know, I want to be in the band, you know, so, and the cool guys, the guy jumping around, well, of course, the drummer first, but then the, the other guys jumping around is, you know, holding the guitar and the piano players have to sit and stay still. And I didn't like that at all. And so I, I really legit, like, kind of said perfect and she found me a guitar teacher which by the way I, I I didn't hate the teacher I hated the lessons okay they made my fingers hurt um I had to play songs I'd never heard of I mean at, at seven years old I didn't know Jimmy Crack Corn you know and uh Felice Navidad or whatever you know it was just like <laughs> it was it was um not pleasant for me so I began to hate it um and then luckily the teacher uh, had, had, he moved and I had to take a break and find another teacher. And that got me a little bit uh, more motivation. I got a little bit older. I got a little bit more um, uh, time to say, hey, I, I did like taking guitar lessons. And my mom found a wonderful teacher um, who immediately switched me from a steel string acoustic guitar to a nylon string classical guitar which if you know anything about those two instruments, steel strings uh, hurt a lot more than the nylon strings and the neck is wider on the classical guitar, which makes it a little bit easier to get to the chords. Mm. Um, so immediately fell in love with that. And I stayed in lessons from, from well, seven to eight to roughly 22. I mean, it was just like, just, I kept taking lessons from other people too, uh, over the course of, of, you know, roughly 15 years. Um, and, um, in yeah, those early, in those early days, what are the uh, practices looking like? Those the, early young ages. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, so the 30 minutes a day kind of thing, uh, mostly, uh, and then at the older I got, the more I wanted to play. So those 30 minute practice sessions became much longer, actually. By the time I was in high school, uh, I could, I would play sometimes up to, you know, a couple of hours. And especially if I had a day off, like a Saturday or a Sunday afternoon, I might play for four or five, six hours. Um, and then I got involved with playing music with people and that, that that's, also that big part of it so um yeah i didn't i never thought music would be a career though i, I didn't i didn't like jump into it at 10 years old like i'm gonna be the in music for the rest of my life i didn't think of it that way in, until much later so what gave me fuel was the fact that um as i got out sort of performing people you know were taking notice and paying attention and encouraging me like hey you're pretty good at this why don't you you know, do more. And what at age? What was age? This? <laughs> we were on the same page there. <laughs> um, well, off and on throughout my my teenage years, but uh, once I got to college, um, I had a horrible uh, time trying to figure out what I wanted to do in life, and I was trying to pick a career and what I loved, and I had various things that I loved and wanted to do, and I became I was a pre med major in college my first year, and 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 was take you know. I, I was taking classes in that and then um, working at the hospital and, you know, kind of interning with some, some physicians and uh, reading and doing some, you know, um, 
stu outside study along with my class. Cause, and I, I got really busy. I mean, I found that quickly. Like I was waking up at 4.30 every morning and then going to bed at 10.30, 11 o'clock every night and did that for two years um, pretty much. And sometimes working 40 hours a week and being in school full time. But I never quit playing music either. And I started having more and more gigs and more and more people tell me that. And so um, uh, a couple people stepped in my life and said, you know, you should do this. And um, I really sat and thought and thought and thought. And about I was uh, around 20 years old when I said, I want to be a professional musician. And that was scary to my dad. Sure being pre-med for two years and working all that. And then all of a sudden he, I go to him, I said, dad, I'm going to switch majors to music and I want to be a professional musician the rest of my life. And he was like, what <laughs> are you talking about? Are you, have you taken crazy pills? <laughs> <laughs> I had a similar experience. We must have similar dads. Um, <laughs> yeah. What, um, what drew you to medicine in the first place? Was it your dad or was it something else? Yeah. I mean, um, I respected that. I, mean, I, I really did. Uh, I loved helping people. I, even my time at the hospital, as I worked at the hospital, I loved that job. I was a phlebotomist. Mm. And um, I got that job the day I turned 18. I mean, I had already planned it out. I, I, you couldn't be high. At that time, and I, I might be, I think you have to have at least a two-year degree now to do that job. I think you have to have some type of medical training before you can do it. Back, back when I applied for it though you did not you did not have to have a degree at all to do that job and so I researched it and I wanted to be hands-on somehow I didn't want to work at the hospital doing something that you know I, I didn't want to do and I found that th this was a really cool thing because I got to I got to you know use needles and learn blood tests and and um and work with doctors and nurses mm -hmm. you know directly like you know if somebody's in the ER and they're injured I could I'm called down to the ER and they're working on this patient and I have to get blood from this patient. And I, I hear all the language and I hear I'm in the action, you know? So I researched it and my dad and I went to HR and applied for that job. Um, and uh, as I applied for the job, um, the, the director came out and met me and, and, and he, he basically told me, he goes, I like you a lot. I think you're perfect for this. And, we train you and get you ready. And uh, I was dedicated and diligent. I didn't miss work. And if somebody couldn't get blood from a patient, you know, I was the first one to stick my hand up and say, Hey, let me go try. And, um, I love the job. The boss looked me, the work, you know, I, the other workers, you know, we, I got along with all them and, and we learned from each other and a lot of, uh, relationships were built from that. And I, and I love that. I love the relationship building, building relationships is a hugely important um, to me. And, uh, uh, so is it a struggle in your head or your mind at this time as you're deciding to make the transition? What was that like for you? I went to people and got counsel. You know, I, I, I asked a lot of questions like I did with the, you know, when I was going to do, you know, medicine. Um, I never, and I, I've never been somebody to just jump out. It's been very rare that I've just jumped out and did something spontaneously uh, like that. Um, I can be spontaneous, but it's usually minor little things. <laughs> uh, when you're talking about, I'm going to move from a, a path in life. I mean, a big path in life to another big path in life. Um, it's, uh, it's something I didn't take lightly and simply, um, you look at it, uh, I'm telling everybody I'm doing medicine and I'm do, I'm working a job and I'm going to school for that. And my, my parents are supporting that to telling everybody at that job, I'm quitting. Um, I'm telling all my professors, I'm moving to a different major in a different department and then telling my parents and my family that I'm not going to go to med school anymore, uh, that I'm going to live this life of, adventure and intrigue in the music industry, <laughs> which is exactly a, you know, a path that you have to take alone. I mean, it's a, it's a very, 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 uh, individual in what's a good word for it. Um, it's 
uh, a fingerprint. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a unique. That's probably the best. It's it's you have a unique thing. That's the reason why we're so fascinated when we look at like behind the music kind of stuff because every band and artist has a unique story that goes along with that. Some basic fundamentals are all there, um, but the, the 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 journey is all unique and how you how that person or, or how someone gets to that place. When I had to go to all these people and tell them that, a lot of people thought I was, yeah, like, why? You're nuts. That's crazy. You know, the percentage, you're not going to make any money. What are you going to do, you know, for a living? And so as I design this degree and as I work in this industry, because I'm not just a college professor, but I'm still a performer and I'm still an artist. I'm still highly active in the world. Um, I talk about it to everybody, like, you know, what are you going to do to make a living? How are you going to make a living doing this? How are you going to find passion? Because you, you wake up and you do it and then you go to, you know, you do it till you go to bed almost. Uh, it never, it never stops. Um, I, uh, told my mother last night, uh, this is funny cause I was talking to her and we, 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 uh, had, or having dinner and, and, um, we're talking about retirement cause my mom is retired and, and, um, she said something and then I said, mom, I'm not going to retire ever, ever. I don't think I'll retire until I, I, I can't, maybe I'm bedridden or I'm, I got dementia or something. I don't, I won't retire. I, I'm always going to do music at some point. I mean, music is always going to be a lot. It's a life passion. I never check in or check out. And I think that was the number one thing that I keyed in on from the very beginning is I don't have to report to a job and clock in and clock out. That's, that's always been a big thing to me. I have a job, uh, but it's one that is very freeing. You know, it's, it's, there's a lot of freedom to it. And I get to create music. I get to work with young people a lot, which is, that gives you life too. I mean, you see the enthusiasm and the passion in some of these students who are, again, 18 to 22, and it gives you passion. And I learned, it's funny because I'm getting to the age where there's a definite generational thing happening, you know, <laughs> and I've learned all this new music that's happening right now from them. You know, it's, it's, it's quite a quite a enriching experience all the time. I love that. I don't want to be stagnant. I'm not a pond. You know? <laughs> sure. Um, so take us back to the, uh, you're making all the plans. You're informing people that you're making the move. What happens? What's your first step? My first step is to get better period. And, and to, you know, I'm, I'm at that time, I'm still playing and practicing and I'm playing some music with other people, but I am not, that's not my goal. You know, that's not the, that's not the journey. It's just cause I love to do it. Now I'm taking what I love and now I have to go on the journey and to get on that, you know, to get on that road, I realized quickly, like, there's a lot of people who are really good. What do I have that makes me more unique and how can I get better? So I just went on that path where I was reading, practicing, studying. I realized quickly that um, at this time and at where I was at, there were a lot of guitar players and not a lot of drummers. And so I went immediately into a buy a drum kit, learn how to play drum phase. <laughs> And so what I did is over a summer, I had three months off where I was kind of working, playing gigs and that kind of thing and bought a drum kit and practiced a lot. I mean, sometimes eight hours a day. Oh, wow. I was playing everything. I would put my headphones on. I didn't have a teacher, but I knew how to read music and I bought books and I set the books up on music stands and I sat behind a drum kit and played along with everything that I liked um, and, you know, played every Dave Matthews song there was at the time because <laughs> he, he was, Carter was such a great drummer yeah. that I loved listening to him and I thought, man, that stuff is hard to play. So I learned all the little shuffles and all the little, you know, uh, nuances of his style, but I also, you know, I listened to, you know, the police and I listened to Stuart Copeland's drumming. I listened to I mean, everybody, I mean, Keith Moon to John, uh, uh, John Bonham and, you know, Ringo Starr and, um, yeah, all those guys. Right. So yeah. I, at 21, 2021, I'm playing drum kit pretty well enough to start gigging as a drummer too. 
But that's not where it really started to take off. Uh, I was playing kind of with one group as a drummer and playing with another group as a guitar player and then playing a third group as a bass player. <laughs> so it was just like this kind of eclectic thing. And while I did all that, I was playing these shows and learning, learning how to, you know, engage the audience and how to do business and how to promote back before the internet, you know? Um, and then uh, doing recordings, being in recording studios, uh, meeting people, learning, you know, how not to do things too, like being around people who were doing things that you, sh you know, shouldn't do. Um, and really kind of building my, um, my foundation. That was a, that's, really part of that process was those, you know, early days were, were foundational for me. I learned from some really, really, really good musicians, uh, how to do it, you know, what and we're, was... we live in a very musically enriched environment here in Tennessee. Sure. What was that? Um, what was that experience like? And, and how do you think about that now where with the guitar, you had that very kind of structured learning and learned, you know, from a teacher, and then the drums, it was self-taught, your kind of own approach to it. Talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, that was different. And I thought I was not that great at drums. That was the whole thing. I never thought I was good. Uh, I never said like, I'm ready to go. I always felt like I wasn't ready. Even when I was playing in those bands, I was like, man, you know, talking to the guys in the band, like, man, thanks for letting me do this because I know there are better drummers out there, you know, because I'm not taught. That's how I always felt. Mm -hmm. So one day I talked to another musician who was older than me, a mentor. I took some guitar lessons with him. And I said, uh, Charlie, Charlie Baker. I said, Charlie, um, hey, I need drum lessons. I really do. I've been playing drums for a year or two now. And he got me uh, a guy who lived in Memphis. Um, and I got a drum lesson with this guy. Now this guy had studied drums uh, it was a fantastic drummer. He had been touring with a bunch of people. He'd been on, you know, like, I think he'd been on like the Jay Leno show at one point. And he had a degree in drumming though from Berkeley. And that was always, that was like, Ooh, you know, uh, and I, it was, it was, it was, it was, that's a great thing for me. I was like, Oh man, he know he must know drumming. Cause that's a great school. It has a great program. And, you know, uh, Steve Vai went there, you know? <laughs> so, um, he came, I can't remember exactly how we met, but he came to Jackson at some point, I think to play a show. And while he was here, he got here a little early and I took a drum lesson with him. And he listened to me to figure out where I was at. And I, he asked me to play a bunch of different grooves and different styles and, and I could do most of them. And, uh, um, uh, he, he sat there and we talked and I remember him showing some things and writing out on a piece of paper, some notes and some music to play. And he handed it to me and he said, man, you're great. He goes, I, this is all, I would say you learn this sheet of paper and you'll be, <laughs> you know, sky's the limit. And uh, he goes, he gave me validation. So um, I realized quickly that I had a style that I could fit somewhere uh, that I um, do, uh, you know, I need to do what I do best and not try to be somebody else, but just to live in my skin and let people see that uh, and say, Hey, you're a really good pocket drummer. You stay on beat. You get your, your fills are, you know, good. Uh, you know, you, you create interesting parts. Uh, you can do recording sessions. That was always, that's big. When I, when I, when I made the transition and decided to move to a big city and put myself into that music scene, I sold that where I was trying to find recording sessions where they would hire session players. Somebody could play drums, somebody could play bass, somebody could play guitar and not just one style of guitar and not one style of drums, but multiple, like you need acoustic guitar. I can play that. You need a classical guitar. I can do that. You need somebody to play smooth jazz. I can do that. You need somebody to play some country. I can do that. You know, it's just, you know, that was the selling point there. And what city were you moving to at this point? I had, I had pondered um, multiple cities. I was trying to move. I knew I had to move somewhere. Uh, and I had graduated with my bachelor of music degree. 
uh, I wanted to go into grad school and to start a professional music career. Uh, and I didn't deter myself from that. I was like, I, I got to stay on this path. Um, and what I did was um, I, I wanted to be in school full time and have the flexibility and freedom to still perform anywhere. Like if I wanted to catch a flight and fly to Seattle, I had the opportunity to do that. So I met with five different graduate programs. Now, what I wanted to do was musicology. I love the study of who, what, when, where, and why kind of stuff. Like, why did that happen? Where did it happen? What were the circumstances? It's anthropology of music. Uh, and I, it gave, that gave me the freedom to also still take instruction from, you know, teachers on guitar or drums. I didn't have to, like, play jazz guitar. It didn't lock me into that. It gave me the possibility to be, again, uh, you know, in multiple areas. Uh, musicology did that to me. The other thing I noticed was that it was a PhD, uh, and I like that part as well. So how many schools have a PhD in musicology? Okay, so that's the first, that was the first step there. And I, you know, I found those schools in, in the South, which is where I wanted to stay. And um, I interviewed, I applied, I, you know, I had some wonderful offers, but the school that stuck out really to me uh, was the University of Memphis. Uh, it had a wonderful musicology. It was in Memphis, uh, the birthplace of, you know, rock and roll and, and, and blues and it had a, it has a hip scene. And so I, that's where I made the move and plugged myself into the Memphis music scene uh, in the late nineties. Um, and uh, there was a reason why, you know, people like Jeff Buckley, you know, came to Memphis, you know, in the late nineties, there was a buzz here um, that, you know, it's still here. It's still happening. Justin Timberlake and, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> tons of people are, you know, are plugged into the scene a little bit. So uh, I like to be in, in Memphis and uh, really jumped right in head first. I mean, within three months I was gigging full time. And so you're establishing yourself. Uh, what happens in Memphis? What happens after that? So um, I learned from a lot of great people. I played in a lot of different bands. And uh, one thing that you quickly learn uh, is to be flexible and to be, uh, uh, be hireable, you know, don't think, you know, that, this gig say yes a lot, you know, <laughs> uh, don't think that, you know, that's not worth my time because a lot of times, you know, you could do, you can make something very positive out of anything actually. Uh, so I stayed positive. I, I stayed on the path again. Um, I stayed very true to that. I didn't waver from it. And I met a lot of people. And one of the relationships that, that I, that I cultivated and developed and, and worked very hard on was with an artist named Doug Pierce and Doug had an international following. And so, um, he was, uh, going, going through a transition in his career at a time, uh, when I met him and I was able to plug in with him and we were able to kind of, uh, have a renaissance of his, of his art. Uh, so I was able to kind of become his, you know, confidant, his kind of partner and, not only a musical partner, but business partner. And I even, we, I even incorporated together and uh, was able to really kind of take over almost like a manager. Um, he focused on one, he was able to focus on one thing and I was able to focus on the other. So two, you know, two brains working together. Uh, and I did that for a long time actually. And, and we traveled the world together and I learned so much and I had so many great relationships from that, that I still, have today and we still play together i still do stuff with him we have a non-profit now actually together what's the name of the non-profit it's called it what okay so the non-profit is uh called it's the band's called willie pete mm. and willie pete is um uh, a non-profit that serves the military community really only we focus on that and we go perform music for bases and troops and that's that's how we work with wounded warrior project uh, the USO, the American Red Cross is a big supporter of ours, and we work with them a lot, actually. Um, the Department of Defense and uh, uh, the NWR, which is like the moral welfare, you know, department. Uh, they work with, you know, there's a lot, I mean, soldiers hurt a lot. They have a lot of 
anxiety and there's a lot of, you know, somebody's, I can't imagine, you can't, we, I can't imagine this but being, you know, deployed or, you know, being on a submarine for six months. And there's a lot of mental stuff that happens there. And we get a chance to really go and just hang out and play music for them and, you know, things like that go all over the place. So that's what we do right now. We're actually, you know, we're, we're, we're planning, even though we can't do much right now, we're still planning ahead to, to hopefully get back out there and uh, still work with them. So yeah, it's, it's been a blast actually. <laughs> so you're in Memphis, you're have hooked up with uh, an artist that you're partnering with to do international tours. Um, what mm -hmm. happens, what happens next in your story? Um, I, I, I stay in school the whole time. I, I pretty much have professors that understand and love what I do. They love how I'm getting the experience, how I'm working uh, with musicology. There is a lot of books <laughs> and, and reading and papers and stuff. And I just stay ahead uh, of that. I mean, I, I had this system that um, I get the syllabus for the class that I was taking and I'd go through it and plan, you know, deadlines for myself and to-do lists. Uh, I still do it today. Um, I'll show, I don't know if it'll show up, but I still use, I like paper and, and I still do to-do lists. <laughs> and I, and I, and this was actually short because we're so we're on quarantine, right? Yeah, so, um, but um, I, I love to-do lists. I, I kind of, I, you know, check, I love the, the you know, check that off kind of thing. Um, there's satisfaction in that for me. And uh I uh, stayed in school and wrote the papers. Um, uh, I invested, you know, some money in some some good uh, computers over the years that uh, that I could take on the road. And uh, you know, uh, Wi-Fi is what you know back in the early two thousands. Wi-Fi was was uh, something that you didn't get everywhere. So uh, I had to, you know, classic thing was like we're. I'll never forget this. We were at a hotel like in Houston, Texas, and I literally had a deadline and I'm pulling We're you know, we're, we're traveling and we're getting to the hotel and I'm typing and trying to figure out how I'm going to get this paper. in. I had to go to the front desk and say, like, I need on the Wi-Fi or computer access or internet. Is there ethernet cable? You know, what, <laughs> what can I plug in? And I, I'm, this is a classic memory of mine where everybody's laughing at me because I'm so just worried to get, you know, find this internet connection so I could get this deadline in. And that's just how it worked. I mean, it was just, that's, that's how I got my doctorate was, was that. And, uh, you know, writing, uh, writing a lot of papers and then researching. And I used to have a tote, a tote that I carried on the road with books and papers in it. And I would be in hotel rooms and have the papers all over the floor and the bed. And, and, and I used to get, uh, even though some of the guys used to stay together, I, I would typically have my own room, you know, so I could do all that. And they, they understood that. And, they were so supportive of that. I mean, they'd be out watching a movie. If we had a night off, they'd be like, Hey, let's go watch a movie. And I'd be like, I'm dissertating. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. You guys know exactly what that is. <laughs> so is it unusual for the student to be on a world tour or other students in your program <laughs> on tour like that? Or is this just something that you or a handful are doing? Um, no, I mean, sometimes students, you know, it just depends on the student, I guess. And I, I can't, um, I can't say that it's a normal thing. Cause I don't think there's a lot of people when people are on tour, usually they're on tour and not in school. And, they don't go for a PhD also. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's very rare. I mean, that, um, a lot of people do, you know, go to school and then they go on tour, you know, or, or vice versa. I mean, some people go to, I've known some people who have been on, you know, they, they had a, great band and experience when they were 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. And then they're 26 and they realize, you know, I'm going to go back to school now, you know, so it just depends on the time and place. Um, again, flexibility there though, you know, it's a lot of work. I mean, there was a lot of work, um, you know, where I'm playing music, I'm managing and booking and making sure we have merch and make sure we're doing the radio spots and make sure the music's being recorded and make sure that the, it gets released. And, you know, if we don't have a new CD out every year, I mean, we don't have anything to sell because what if we play the, you know, if we're playing Houston and we sell 300 CDs, the next time we go to Houston, we got to 
have a new CD because they already had the, uh, you know, the CD. So, mm-hmm. and our fans, you know, fans at the time were wanting music all the time. We, we had to crank it out. So typical, and you see this a lot, actually, you'll know, you'll go, oh yeah, is uh, we would record one year, like in the studio. And then we, at some point record a live mm-hmm. show and try to put that out as a record, maybe for the next year. And in the live stuff, we'd in- incorporate other aspects uh, things so it sound a little different so you know between the studio and the live stuff we ended up being uh, like six six years full time uh i think eight records eight albums you know so a pretty good amount of content and you know 12 songs each so we're put you know it was a and that was just that period then we transitioned to other things you know that's it was a season you know that was 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 very good and beneficial and we still think back on, on it fondly and still we still have the videos and the records to, to to love you know so the memories and stuff are still there yeah, yeah that dovetails on my question i was curious uh if you were able to enjoy yourself but it sounds like it was a good experience for you yeah the experience is one that you know of course you have ups and downs all the time and that's what i tell my students a lot you're gonna have a lot of no's and down moments um, and I always usually equate, I always equate it to baseball players, really successful baseball players, um, really successful baseball players get out seven out of every 10 at bats, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? So if our, again, to show that in class, I'm like, look, a good major league baseball player hits 300. That means they get out seven times out of 10. They only get hits three times out of 10. So you've got to look at that and be encouraged to say, there's going to be a lot of strikeouts. There's going to be a lot of ground outs. There's going to be a lot of pop flies. They get caught and no's in your inbox. There's going to be a lot of no's in your inbox. And um, you're going to have to stare at people and they're going to be, you know, they're going to say, this is not the fit for us, or this is not going to work or we're not going to give you a record deal or we're not going to give you a publishing deal. We're not going to sign you to this, you know, marketing campaign for your music to be in a commercial or whatever it is, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot of no's, but you got to be out there. And that one, yes, or that two or that three, yes, um, could be life changing and could set you up for the rest of your life. You know, if you get that one big hit on a movie and that movie plays all the time, you know, it's a great, great, great uh, check. (laughs) <laughs> then you get the rest of your life you know you'll get paid for that for the rest of your life and uh and in 70 years after <laughs> yeah for some right yeah um, and as a, so as a performance coach uh, one of the things I'm obviously immensely interested in is motivation so talk about that a little bit why did you pursue the PhD and what was this pursuit of being a a you know band member and performer and manager yeah, the motivation always was, uh, I think, ingrained in me from a child. Again, my mom was highly motivated. My dad ha- didn't have the opportunities that I had. My dad, um, you know, had had a great childhood. He had a great parents, had great parents, but he was adopted. Mm-hmm. And he never knew who his real parents were till the day he passed away. He never knew who they were he he always felt like he wasn't wanted almost like he was given up and my dad struggled with that so he instilled in me like work hard work hard work hard work hard I mean that was it I remember again days where uh I had a lot of energy you know I had a lot of passion again and uh, I couldn't just sit around and uh dad would be like go mow the yard you know, <laughs> you know, go cut wood. You know, <laughs> I was I was a lot of that. You know, just like uh, played a lot of sports. I mean, I I played three sports all the time. I mean, I was always playing baseball, always playing football, always playing basketball, or always on the golf course. I mean, there there was a lot of energy there, um, and motivation to 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 do that was was ingrained in me from my parents my dad loved driving me around he, he did he loved the fact he could he's like all right we're gonna go do this and we're gonna go do this because because you know, he didn't have that you know I think or he didn't feel that my my adopted grandparents who were wonderful people um 
you know, they were salt of the earth kind of people. They were, you know, farmers, you know, so uh, they worked very hard and my dad worked hard, you know, but he didn't have a lot of opportunities to go, to, you know, to go to college, for example. And he didn't feel like he was good enough to go to college. And so going to college in his brain was, you know, big deal. And um, being successful meant that. And my mom was really one of the first people in her family to go to college. Uh, and uh, she worked hard and got her master's degree and then was, was really diligent and, you know, up by five and, you know, working hard. Both of them were actually, you know, hard workers. So I learned that, you know, very authentically. And that's another part of this career is being authentic. I mean, the sure. first thing you realize is there's a lot of people who aren't and you don't want to be around those people. You know, mm -hmm. authenticity is, is really important. And I love, I love, especially in this business, in the music business, is I love the diversity. I think diverse people are enriching. I don't always agree with everybody, but I love the fact that people have diverse opinions about things. You know, I just really, really, really adore that about this industry. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at that point. So, sorry, no my problem. phone is going off. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of your six year run on the tour, um, are you still in a, a PhD program at this point? Uh, yeah. And so what sort of happened is uh, I, everybody gets to that place. I think the whole band and we had multiple band members, but uh, all of us kind of get to this place where uh, married, having kids, it's a different thing when you have babies, you know, uh, uh, oh, yeah, it's, it becomes a different thing, right? Um, so babies change a lot, and they, they, the guys were. In fact, Doug has had kids before all, all of us did, so he 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 really is experiencing the whole, you know, fatherhood, and he starts to look for something where he can stay at home more, and uh, that's that's that really drew that to a close. Uh, not completely, but shut it, shut it down from being full-time to part-time is what I called it. So that gave me the opportunity to really, um, you know, find uh, a, a pause in my own like professional playing career and to really focus on the, getting the dissertation done. Uh, and the dissertation and having babies and the family and all that stuff was, was a life dream. I mean, my dad, I told my dad, I'd still be a doctor one day, you know, that was, uh, <laughs> you know, even though I'm not going to medical school, I'll still, you know, uh, uh, become a doctor and I can be a doctor in music, you know? <laughs> so that was the, the point. And, um, I really looked up to my, my, my professors and I love that. That was a big, you know, stepping stone and, a big goal for me. And I look, what, what, you know, I told you earlier, what do I like? I like goals and I like to do lists and I like to work to that. And so every step I made on that ladder got me closer and closer to the end goal, which is to earn that PhD and to do music the rest of my life, you know, as a, as a professional musician slash college professor, which is what a lot of people have done over the years. I mean, I, I talk about that in music history, you know, there's, you know, you know, you had your Aaron Copeland's and your Stravinsky's and your Arnold Schoenberg's, and they were all working in academics while also being professional musicians and composers. Yeah. And so we're would, all this, would this picture be you after your hooding ceremony? Yes. Um, this is, uh, yeah, my hair, you could tell my hair is a lot longer <laughs> then and uh, a lot darker. And uh, uh, yes, this is my uh, this is August of 2008. Uh, my kids are very young still. Uh, and my wife still looks the same though. Uh, she's, she's ageless. Um, but yeah, this is when I get the, the doctorate, uh, in musicology. It's interesting because you mentioned being goal focused and liking to do lists and all that, but it also sounds like you kind of made the hand motion there of like you like that progress and that path but within that you it seems like you like the flexibility and freedom and diversity even within yourself right of playing all different instruments and all that so across you like being this 
bigger, fuller thing, but like the structure in the standpoint of moving forward and having that, is that fair to say? Yeah, I think, um, I think you hit the nail right on the head, to be honest with you. I mean, that's, I, 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 um, I like being, I like to have that uniqueness to me again. Um, I think I sell that pretty well too. You know, I think that's, um, something that, especially today we have to have, you know, in, in, in this career, mm-hmm. not, not, you can't just, you know, um, be, I mean, I, I guess you can, I mean, I, I think though, if you have other aspects of, you know, more of a utility player in this, and you've got to be able to kind of record and you've got to be able to play and you've got to be able to produce and you've got to be able to, you know, do multiple things. So, yeah, I like the structure, but I also like the diversity. <laughs> sure, sure. So. so once you get your degree, um, your PhD, what happens then? Well, I was hired almost immediately. Uh, I had this wonderful job interview back um, at my alma mater, actually, Lambeth University in Jackson, Tennessee. And I had the, the uh, I'd been called about the position two years before. And I said no, because I just didn't think I would have time to simply start a program. So I was able to uh, um, table it a little bit. I actually reached out to a friend of mine and I said, hey, there's this position. And he and I talked and he took the job and he and he he built it. And then he had so many students that I was able to come on board. Mm-hmm. So he and I kind of partnered. It was a fantastic relationship. We still work together a lot today. Um, and uh, I was able to interview and uh, got the job and, and, and at first drove back and forth for a couple of years. Then the University of Memphis um, had an opportunity to sort of buy the Lambeth. Um, and Lambeth was a small private uh, liberal arts college that was going through some financial difficulties. And uh, we transitioned from the Lambeth University to the University of Memphis, Lambeth campus, and uh, became a state school. And, um, and I was able to rehab the program a little bit, kind of re- rehash it, I guess, uh, see what went well and what didn't go well the first couple of years and, and rework the program and developed it into what it is today. And I'm still, we're still tweaking it. I mean, it's always a, a work in progress like we are, you know. It sounds like some of the, um, you know, you you take into your program and your teaching some of the lessons you learned along the way about yourself and and what the business is like. Can you speak to some of those things? Yeah, I think experience is a big, big part of what uh, I try to, you know, give to my students. I try to tell them like, hey, don't make this mistake. Uh, Do this. Uh, Don't do that. And a lot of them do come to me with with you know, with questions like, Hey, I've got this opportunity or I got, um, I got this contract, you know, what, what should I do? Um, so, uh, the the experience, the experiential part of it all. I also, again, work with great people. I work with colleagues that, uh, not only on the Lambeth campus, but on the Memphis campus, uh, um, I have wonderful people around me and that's, that's important to have, you know, um, you know, it's that, it's that dynamic that, um, you know, be a fountain, not a drain, you know, <laughs> give life, don't take it away and suck it. You know, <laughs> that's basically it. You know, uh, uh, don't, don't be around people who do that and don't be that kind of person. And, uh, so my students see that they really do. And, uh, there's a classic quote from, uh, saving private Ryan where they're all complaining about trying to find this, you know, Ryan, you know, who is this guy that they got to go try to find? Uh, And they're all griping and griping. And Tom Hanks says, basically, you know, I don't gripe downward. I gripe upward, you know? So you guys gripe to me. I don't gripe back. I gripe to my superiors. And I, 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 I never forget that. So I try not to let them see the negativity almost. Uh, I don't go and I'm like, you know, I understand them, but I don't, you know, usually, again, uh, make it a negative thing. I try to make it all positive. And so what does performing look like for you while you're, now that you're a professor? Performing actually 
uh, is different. I still perform a lot. Um, when I first took this job, um, I started a, you know, I started a, a little band that I could play on, you know, locally. And then I still did recording sessions. I still traveled. I still would go to Nashville and Memphis and do stuff there and, you know, bounce back, back and forth. You know, it's three hours difference. So, and I'm right in the middle. I'm a, I, we have an interstate through Tennessee that goes from the Memphis all the way through, you know, Jackson, Nashville, Knoxville, Bristol, and it make, it connects the state there. And it's really, really quite fascinating. Um, so I'm able to just hop on the interstate and bounce back and forth a lot. Um, an hour and 10 to Memphis and two hours to Nashville. So it's, uh, it's close enough where I can get, you know, to both cities. And the students recognize that too, because Nashville is the center of the musical in, you know, in the universe. Um, uh, Memphis still has a lot of possibilities as well. Atlanta's not too far away. Mm -hmm. um, so those those are pretty big hubs, you know, here in the South for music. Uh, depends on what you want to do, of course, you know, and um, the choice in, in the city. But um, music making is still part of the daily routine. I still play a lot of drums. I still play a lot of guitar. I still record a lot. I still produce a lot. I still... Uh, I, I mean, last year I probably traveled 15,000 miles, 15,000 road miles. <laughs> That's wow. a lot. Yeah. So uh, I don't know how many states, but uh, half probably. Uh, so in a year, half the states uh, plus England, uh, Germany, Spain, and. Um, seems like there's somewhere else <laughs> but, yeah. but that's not enough <laughs> so, half, so half the states in the union and, and then um you know european countries and in, in, in just one year so 2019 was a good year when it came to performing uh, i recorded uh two or three albums a ton of various songs played and produced and mixed and mastered and played live shows and uh, pretty high output plus teaching full time yeah 25 making me majors. feel like i am like the most unmotivated person <laughs> <laughs> uh, i have a high level of energy i do I, I mean i've always you know like i told people you know i have to i have to spend it some way and uh um i did work i worked with a uh, a wonderful artist last year I, I worked with several different people but i worked i had the the very uh, i had the blessing of working with Lauren Pritchard, her stage name is Lolo, and um, uh, I kind of became her music director, her drummer, uh, tour manager, and she had a number one hit. She co-wrote Panic at the Disco's High Hopes, which was on every radio and television commercial and movie. I mean, it was just high output, and she was uh, booking show after show after show, and I played, you know, you know, pretty much every show with her over the course of last year. Uh, she's taking a hiatus right now because of multiple things, the, the, the pandemic and she's pregnant. So uh, she's married and starting a family. And the, like I said earlier, it was when that kind of happens, you, you mm -hmm. have to take usually a step back and, you know, she's growing a human right now. So she's, <laughs> she's worried about that. Um, and um, I also had the Willie Pete shows. So we, I was traveling with them and I had to coordinate that, you know, so, and there was some one offers, as well which are various shows with other people um here in jackson we actually had a music venue kind of open last year as well uh which is hub city and hub city has a huge stage and a sound system and i was asked by the by the owner to step into the role of being the contact for the music ven venue mm -hmm. itself um so as he booked the shows traveling shows like major artists uh, coming into Jackson, uh, I would then take the contracts and review them, uh, reach out to the tour managers and the production and say, hey, here's what we have at the venue. And, you know, this is the system that we have. This is the size of the stage. This is the lighting console and the lights that we have in-house. There's a lot of nuts and bolts when it comes to working with tours. They are 
trying to make a living traveling nightly doing shows mm -hmm. and every venue is different. So it's important for me to relay that information to the people who do that job. So when they get there, that they're, they know exactly what to expect. And we represent not only the venue, but the city of Jackson and the, you know, the, and for me, the university, because I see it as an opportunity for my students sure. to work, to get sort of internship hours. Yeah. Really to say, experience it. Right. To have somebody that has a hit on the country radio coming from Nashville, they're playing, you know, they're coming from that. That's another good thing is tours start in Nashville a lot and they hit interstate 40 and they head either East or West. And if you can catch somebody heading West or two hours away, so their first show on the road could be Jackson. And it's also like what happened on many of the shows, it's their first show. So it's their dress rehearsal. It's perfect. I mean, Cadillac 3 was just here a couple months ago. Cadillac 3 has a really big following and they're, they're a national act. And the tour manager told me, you know, that, hey, this is our first show. It's kind of our dress rehearsal. We're actually hooking up the in-ears for the first time, you know? <laughs> we're doing the in-ear test, you know? Which is, they, they literally were labeling the packs and labeling the console that night as they were there. And uh, so uh, many hats, you know? It's like, okay, I'm going to take off the professor hat and I'm put on the Hub City hat, which I do. I mean, I literally put the Hub City hat on, you know, and work the shows with my students um, and then when I'm out on the road, I have my students work and when I'm gone, they do the shows. And so they're getting that experience and they learn real quick, whether or not they're cut out for it and, mm. and if they want to do this, you know, full time. And so, yeah, 15,000 miles, you know, multiple States countries, and then coming home to that, and then being dad and husband and all the other stuff, you know? <laughs> It's really cool. Um, and we'll break it up if we need to, but I'm going to ask you two questions at once. Um, you mentioned early on not believing that you were very good or that you didn't have the chops. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to ask you about um, was, so was there a moment you realized that you did have the chops would be the first question. The second question, a similar question is, was there a moment that you realized that you would be making a living out of it? Oh, but it's, it, that's such a great question because that's what we all do. We are we're all, I mean, all the students, when they come in, they're like, how, how am I going to play? How am I going to do art and make a living at it? That's the, that's the question. You know, the parents, more importantly, I can't tell you how many parents have emailed me and come to me, just said like, Hey, I'm really nervous about my, my child trying to earn a living in music. I'm just sure. so I'm petrified of it. I mean, it's, it's a stand. I mean, I feel the same way, you know, um, it's, there's a trust there. There's a, there's a, there's a, um, I don't know, a, uh, um, a moment, uh, where you have to trust yourself. You have to believe in it. You know, you have to say, I am good enough. And that's what I had to let go of that, that social anxiety of standing in front of people and saying like, do they like me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, the beautiful thing about studying musicology is that you hear and you read all the stories about everybody's kind of like that. You know, I live in the city where Carl Perkins grew up and basically performed. He wrote the song Blue Suede Shoes really one of the first big rock and roll hits. Mm -hmm. He toured with Elvis. Um, he toured with Johnny Cash. I mean, he played, he had a remarkable career. I think the Beatles uh, recorded more Carl Perkins covers than any other artist. Um, George Harrison looked up to Carl Perkins uh, and uh, really idolized him. Um, Tom Petty did. Um, John Fogarty did. Um, so I had the really the blessing again to be in this area playing music where he lived and he would be at shows and he you could play a gig with Carl and then uh literally I played blue suede shoes one night with Carl with a dream come true, you know, at, at 20 years old. Um wow. so when when you have those opportunities, 
uh, that's, that's again, take them, you know, do it. Uh, and Carl told me one time, he said, and he has this, he had this whisper when he got really serious. He's telling you something really important. He would go from kind of being big voice to whispering like this. And uh, he got down and he got whispered and he goes, you know what Elvis used to do before he performed? I said, no, Mr. Carl, what? He goes, throw up. <laughs> he would puke in a bucket. And then walk on the stage and blow people's minds because he was so nervous beforehand. And then when he walked on the stage, he just became Elvis, you know, this personality. And uh, uh, he told me, you know why he popped his collar up? I was like, no, but, that, you know, Elvis popped. That was kind of one of the things is pop the collar up and he'd be Elvis. He goes, he did it because he had pimples. <laughs> <laughs> and you just really, okay, he was human. He had pimples. He threw up. He was nervous. He didn't let that deter him. He didn't let that bother him. He actually took that energy of being nervous and and having faults and having blemishes. He didn't let that bother him. He he said, "Okay, that's who I am, and I've got to be it." You know, and he became Elvis. You know, <laughs> and and that's. I, I'm never going to be Elvis. Um, I'm never going to be that, but I want to chase that. You know, I want to be that. I want to, I want to fight for that. Um, why not? You know, if you say, man, I'll, ne I'll, I, there's no way I'm going to be Elvis. No, I want to be Jeremy. You know, that's, that's who I'm going to be. And I'm going to fight, you know, for that, for that dream of, okay, I can be, you know, big and great and grand in my own way. And that's how it's going to work. And, <laughs> I'm going to do that. I'm going to do it. <laughs> it's awesome. It's a fascinating story. Thank you. Uh, uh, what do you view as the keys to your success? Um, hard work. There's a lot of working. Uh, you can't, you know, you can't think that it's going to happen. No one's going to knock on your door. It's just not going to happen in this business. Um, the, the work ethic is the, really the key. Uh, building relationships. Uh, you've got to be approachable. You've got to be um, authentic. Uh, say yes a lot. Put yourself out there. You know, uh, swing and miss. You know, <laughs> uh, um, there's a moment I can't remember exactly when, but I heard um, Mike Schmidt. He was a professional baseball player. Go back to baseball. Uh, mm -hmm for the Philadelphia Phillies. He was, he's a hall of famer. He hit over 500 home runs and was one of the best third basemen of all time. Um, and uh, I, I heard Mike Schmidt say this in an interview one, at one point, he goes, I never go up there to try to hit home runs. I go up there to just make contact. And I think that's a wonderful quote. I go up to the plate just to make contact. He gets his chance in the big leagues and he takes his opportunity and he says, I don't go up there to swing to hit home runs. I go up there just to make contact. And I think that's a lot of performers don't do that. I think they go up there thinking like, this is my big moment. I got to, got to make it happen. Um, and uh, again, I think that quote alone is, is, is pretty powerful for me. That's it stuck. And when it's stuck like that, I teach that like, are you ready for the big leagues? Number one, have you got the training? Have you got the experience of the minors, you know, and playing the, playing the game mm -hmm. to get to the big leagues? Do you feel ready for that? And then when you, when you feel like you're ready for that and you're there, don't go to the plate with, you know, the thought of I've got to, you know, hit the grand slam to win the game, get to the plate and trust your instincts, instincts, and your experience and make contact. That's, you know, a good, a good that's for me, you know, uh, that's a good very quote. Very powerful, yeah. Um, what have you learned about yourself throughout this journey? Um, you know, it's not all, it's not all roses and, and you can't let the, you know, the ups and downs, you know, you can't let the downs destroy you. I think the thing I've learned about myself is I have a lot of stamina. I have a lot of patience. Stamina and patience. Um, you know, I, I I can't let the negative stuff make me quit and bring me down. And 
there's a lot of it out there and there's a lot of, you know, again, the nose in the inbox. There's a lot of that. So uh, I don't let that, I've learned a lot about myself by not, not letting the negative stuff happen. And I'm curious, have the, the nose have, is your, do you still get the same amount of nose as you did in the beginning? Um, that's a good question, actually. I, 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 maybe I just don't pay attention to them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I mean, I, I'd say I do. I mean, I, I, I get a lot. I think I get a lot of yeses um, now. Uh, and I kind of I think I've gotten to the point of my career where um, maybe I don't ask a lot of questions anymore. Does that make sense? Sure. Like, I'm not asking a lot of I'm, I'm, I'm getting asked, you know, and I have to say no a lot, actually. No. Mentally, what kind of transformation was that when you started to have realizing that you had to say no yourself? Well, the, the realizing I have to say no part took a little bit longer you know, because, <laughs> I, because I wanted to say yes all the time. I was like, yes, yes, yes. And then I realized I can't do it. I can't do it all. Um, mentally, physically, emotionally, it, it, I have to pick what, you know, what, seems to be best for me and or best for my students or best for my family or you know um i have to uh, uh think about uh, my mental health my physical health um what i can actually do i mean there was many times where i you know i i hate uh you know being in an airline and saying hey we double booked you know <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, can't do it um and um yeah i I've learned to say no uh, by, and I, I learned to say no with, with a solution. That's usually, that's, that's the nugget there that I never just say, no, nah, good luck. I, I usually say no, but why don't you try this? Mm -hmm. Why don't you do this? Why don't you, um, you know, um, reach out to this person? I usually kind of move it, you know, and, um, I can't do it, but do go here. And that, that really softens the blow of no. <laughs> Sage advice. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so do you feel that you've made any sacrifices that through the, your journey? Um, you know, family. Yeah. There's some family moments. Definitely. I, I missed things. Um, when I'm gone and I'm in another country for three weeks, I mean, you miss a lot. Uh, my wife has endeared a lot of that actually, and uh, has always been supportive. She's never made me feel guilty about it. Um, you know, missing a you know a wedding anniversary almost every year. I mean, because it's in the summer and I tour <laughs> so much, but I miss the I miss the anniversary almost every year. Uh, the actual date. Now we celebrate, but it's not you know it's not the same. You know, uh, the kids my children are old enough now to, to really get it too. And, uh, so they, they realize that when I miss a baseball game or I miss a, you know, a competition or whatever, uh, they understand that. Um, so yeah, there's some sacrifice there still. And, um, but I mean, a lot of other people, I mean, there's a lot of people in this business that sacrifice a lot, you know, in, in, in any type of performance based, if it's a sport or, you know, if it's acting or, you know, uh, you know, whatever, a lot of people, you know, usually the family sacrifices, you know, whoever's staying at home, usually. What if both parents do it? You know, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it even harder. Yeah. Well, I think sure. about John Krasinski and Emily Blunt, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're both actors and they both work a lot, you know, so I hope, I bet you really, their kids just travel with them, I, I assume, so. Yeah, probably. Um, what advice would you give an aspiring music industry student or uh, performer? Well, um, the, the best advice is to, to be you, to, to find what you're good at, to, to, to kind of focus on that um, and to work really hard, be diligent. Uh, don't give up, have a lot of stamina again. Um, uh, get a lot of experience, you know, um, be, be out there, put yourself out there, even if you don't feel like you can. Um, there's some musicians or some artists who are, um, they're not on stage. They're not, they're, they're, they're people who work behind the scenes. Um, there's a lot of people who, um, there's more people behind the scenes than are, they're, you know, 
than there are on the stage. Um, so, you know, find what makes you happy. And if, if, if you see one thing's not quite working out the way you, you planned it, um, there's a reason and follow that a little bit, you know, don't let, don't let it, uh, you know, deter you and knock you down. Don't, don't let it knock you down, you know, stay, stay strong. So a lot of people don't do, I mean, it's, it's not one way. It's not one path again. You know, there's a lot of different ways out there and we're, we, we change all the time. There's, you know, go, you can't help like right now. We can't help this. There's nothing we can do, you know? So we've got to get creative and, you know, everybody's not torn. There's nobody torn. I mean, this unprecedented, right? We've never had a moment in history that this didn't happen, but we're finding new ways to do it. And I think we're going to come out of this with a different mindset, you know, and appreciation too. Sure. Most definitely. You, you had mentioned early on, you know, when you made the decision to leave the, the path to become a, a doctor and, and pursue that and switch to music that, you know, a bunch of people and your dad included kind of questioned that. Um, did they come around? Did your dad come around? Did everybody else who uh, kind of was, I guess, scared for you in that moment, did they, they shift their perspective? Yeah, they did actually. My dad was so proud of me when, when I, I mean, I remember like his, his buddies, his friends um, over the years uh, would, you know, if I'd see them out and, you know, they'd be like, you know, I knew most of them, but some of them I didn't know. They would come up to me and talk to me and say, hey, I'm really good friends with your dad. And man, he talks about you all the time, you know, that kind of stuff. So yeah, my dad was very proud. I really enjoyed um, the fact that, you know, once I finished and had it and I was able to say, see God, <laughs> uh, I have it and, uh, and it's terminal. And uh, <laughs> um, I really enjoyed that. Yeah. It was a, it's, it was a moment for me to, to, to say, you know, I worked really hard and, and I, most people were very supportive, you know, uh, you know, my, my, I, my uncle, my mother's brother, uh, is a, a very mathematical person. Yeah, you know, I get a lot from him. Actually, I think I think I think I I have a lot of DNA on that. <laughs> there. um, there's a lot of gene pool. Um, I jumped in this gene pool. Uh, uh, now he's he's really uh, somebody who was very mathematical. I mean, I'm, I remember the story of um, he graduated high school and was going to go to the Navy. He wanted to go into the military service. And, uh, but he wanted to have like a thousand dollars in his banking, like saved before he went to basic or, you know, the summer of his senior year to his, when he left to go to basic, which was three months. So he lived in a rural section of New Jersey in the Southern part of New Jersey, mm -hmm. not a lot of job opportunities, not a lot of, of, of money-making opportunities for somebody who just graduated high school. So he thought, what can I do? And this is exact. this is exactly how I am. What can I do to make this goal happen? What are the resources that I have at my, at my hand, my fingertips, uh, to make that goal of, for him, a thousand dollars in his bank account before he leaves to go to basic. So he goes, we have a lot of land in Southern Jersey that is ready to, uh, have crops to, to grow. And that's the one thing that his father uh, had him do was be in the garden all the time when he was a kid. So he went to people who had big plots of land and said, hey, can I rent your land to grow crops for the summer? And he researched what were, what were the crops that people were buying, buying in the local farmer's market. If you've ever been to New Jersey, you know that if you drive through the southern part of New Jersey, every... Um, couple miles on the road on the side of the road are little farmers markets yeah I grew, I grew up in New Jersey actually just outside of Princeton area yeah so I know exactly so, what you're talking about <laughs> all these places have like there's vegetable stands and fruit stands all over the place yeah. and it was even I think probably 
more back when he was, we're talking what, okay, let me do the math here. He would have been, it would have been the early 60s, mid 60s. So um, he planted these crops, he researched what was, what, what he could, you know, grow and sell during that season and what would be, and he found the okra. That was the crop that he decided to plant and he did it and he made more than a thousand dollars over the wow. summer. Um, and then went to the Navy, had a successful Navy career, uh, went into, um, some type of computer, early computer based, uh, you know, um, job in the Navy, learned that trade. And then when he, when he left the Navy, he transitioned into in the seventies, he transitioned into a company called IBM as, you know, a computer expert. <laughs> and he was able to retire at 55 years old. Wow. You know, and, um, I, I got a lot of that, I think from him, I'm that that's sort of the same kind of thinking process. I'm kind of planning and thinking and he, he, um, I mean, he super, he's still, he's still doing it too. He's, still, he's retired still, you know, he's just <laughs> loving life and living it. And he's what, uh, he's in his late seventies now. So, uh, wow. yeah. Yeah. So has there ever been a time in your path that you felt like you were faking it? No, no, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think there's ever been that. Um, there's been some down times. I mean, I was at Lambeth when it was, going through all that financial difficulty and we didn't get paid for five months. So, wow. um, luckily I had some other money coming in, but some professors didn't, of course, you know, so nice. they were, their mortgage was in, you know, they were in foreclosure or it was a bad time. We all have PTSD from that. Who stick, who stuck around. <laughs> we all th think about to like, we think about that time and it's the dark times, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the not so fun side of academia. <laughs> yeah, but we could not quit because we had students that were relying on us and it wasn't their fault. They paid the money, you know, they had come to this, you know, this campus and they had paid their tuition and the campus, you know, had, had, uh, made poor decisions you know, over the, over multiple years, not one year, but going back long period of time, there were multiple, there were great people there, but there were some bad decisions there. So, yeah. And that was dark. So there, th there's been down times, um, you know, um, yeah, I, I, that, that's, that's, that was a pretty bad <laughs> black eye in my, in my, in my life. And it was right after I had had this high moment. And I, I, I tell students that I had this really, really massive peak of, you know, PhDs done, performing careers, really good. And I get this job. I think it's going to be perfect because I know it. And it's at my alma mater and it's in my hometown and my parents live here and my wife's parents live here. And I mean, it was all working. It was just perfect. You know? <laughs> this is fantastic. And then we can't pay you. It's a and it goes on and on and on and on. And, you know, were we two months into this where some people aren't getting paid? We couldn't f file for unemployment. We couldn't. We were hired, but not being paid, <laughs> you know. Wow. So, um, and. Even though some some people were, were made to quit, um, a lot of us didn't and stuck out. And we got the kids that needed to graduate to graduate. We got the kids that needed to transition to another school to transition to another school. And we advised and we taught our classes. And and then we complained to each other at lunch, you know, <laughs> about so the school, you know. <laughs> so it's literally a sinking ship at this point. Um. Somebody, somebody used that analogy once, um, that it was sort of like the Titanic. And I love, I mean, again, I love the image of, you know, the, the, the podcast, you know, um, that we couldn't see what was underneath the water. Uh, and we hit it. And the school should have shut down a long time before it did. So and people always talk about how the Titanic should have sunk a lot quicker than it did. Mm -hmm. Uh, but many lives were saved because 
it had been built so well. Um, and uh, even though it was a critical wound to the ship itself, um, that the, the, the craftsmanship that went into the boat, it, it was able to stay afloat for much longer than it should have. And Lambeth was, was that to me. And, and I, that's not, that's somebody else telling me that that was a great, a great image for me to think about. Yeah, you're right. I mean, if you think back to what was actually going on, yeah, that there were a lot of people who did a lot of great things to keep that ship afloat um, when it should have really just sunk quickly and 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 in a in, in a you know a, a bad time. And that was two thousand. We're talking about when that recession was happening mm-hmm. in the late two thousands. You know, uh, Lambeth should have sunk then. And it didn't until 2011. Uh-huh. So yeah. it probably stayed afloat for three or four years longer than it should have, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as you probably are aware, most of uh, Lauren and I have almost two decades of experience studying expertise. Um, and one of the, it's not just our area, but uh, one of the classic debates is nature versus nurture. Mm-hmm. Um, so how much is, of an your capability or ability ability to do something is based on something you're born with was one extreme. The other extreme would be, um, or that all of it is due to uh, something you're born with. The other extreme would be none of it has anything to do with what you're born with. It's what you experience. And of course there's everything in the middle. Um, if, if you were to give a percentage, um, how do you think about that classic debate? Yeah. Uh, I'm not an expert like you guys are, and, and it, it, I I can only tell you how I feel and what mm-hmm. what that is, what it looks like to me. And I think that there is a about a yin and a yang, a balance. I think there is there's you got to have again something in the DNA uh, that that gives you talent, you know. Uh, but it's not all about talent, you know. You've got to work hard too, and uh, I can't remember exactly when, but this. This came up, it's about two years ago. This came up in a discussion um, and I was having a discussion with multiple people about it. And, um, you know, it can't be about talent. You know, somebody can be born at, you know, with perfect pitch and can play piano at eight years old. Um, but you also got to, to work hard. You've got to get out there. Uh, you've, you've got to uh, uh, build relationships and, and you know, it's got to be a little bit of everything. I think. I think you know, you got to have that. And that doesn't mean, you know, you've got. That doesn't mean you're you're born perfect pitch and can play piano at eight years old or write operas at twelve or whatever. Um, there are people out there, and I, I I consider myself when I actually do say this that um, just because I had some talent uh, at first didn't mean didn't mean anything. You know, um, everything I've done, I've worked very hard for, overly hard. Um, and I remember when I, when I was auditioning for one of the bands when I was like 19, this band sent me a list of 40 songs to, to learn. And they gave me a week to learn them. And I had an audition. And they were auditioning multiple people. Now, I could play. Uh, this is a bass gig. So I could play the bass. And I had the bass rig. And I, could, I had the equipment. And I could play it. But that doesn't mean I'm going to walk into the audition know the songs i have to learn the songs i have to work hard to learn those songs so even though you can play something and you have the equipment doesn't mean you know it (laughs) you know um so what i did with that was as i experienced that um uh, that audition process the week of working hard i walked in and played any song they wanted me to play like you know this song yeah i played a little bit that's great you know i played this song i played this song and I'm amazed. I'm absolutely amazed how many times I've done auditions. I've done auditions, and the person comes in and doesn't know any of the material at all, like wow. none. Like, oh, you mean I, I was supposed to know that? <laughs> you know, I'm just <laughs> not looking at it as a um, experiential thing. Where, yeah, you can play. And I've said this to people. I, I, I don't know how many times. You're a fantastic player but you're, you don't fit with the work ethic that we are wanting. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, um, 
we had a horrible time with drummers uh, when I was starting with Doug, that guy. Uh, I had played drums, of course, for him, but we didn't have a guitar player. And so we auditioned some guitar players and Doug came to me and says, hey, man, you're 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 much better than all these guys. Let's try to see if we can find a drummer. <laughs> so I switched over to guitar, learned all the songs on guitar. Uh, we started auditioning drummers. And we took drummer after drummer after drummer after drummer on the road. I mean, and so we'd pick up or we'd fly in or whatever, a drummer from this town or that town. And I, I don't want to give away some things because mm-hmm. just in case they are watching one day. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we had this one particular time where this drummer had um, auditioned and he was fantastic, literally fantastic drummer. So we took him on the gig. and when we got him to the to the live show and put him in front of a bunch of people he suddenly forgot how to play drums and really just struggled the whole time so there's all those aspects to it you know um you know you you've got to work hard you've got to get your experience you got to put your hours in you know there's no free lunch is, is the classic saying and one of the processes is that you got to learn the stuff you got to have the talent. You got to put yourself out there. All those, you know, elements are there for, for this business at least. And that, that drummer was a great drummer and he probably is today. I mean, he just wasn't ready for that. Um, again, he got to the majors and didn't hit the ball, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> so is there anything that we have not asked that you think would be important for your story? And you guys have done a great job. I mean, you, you've asked really good questions and I hope I've, you know, relayed my experiences and my ethos. And, you know, the biggest thing, and I always say that, I always make fun of myself for saying that, the biggest thing, and then I'll say another, (laughs) this is the biggest thing. This is the biggest thing. Uh, I, we're all in a state of transition, I think. You know, you can't predict anything ever, you know, but you got to be ready. You got to work hard. You have to make opportunities, build relationships. You've got to get um, ready for that. And, uh, um, I, you know, one of the things that, that I'll say here that, that, that I do say a lot to my students is, um, you know, your mind, um, has to be ready. You have to learn, you have to really work hard. And, um, um, we just don't know. We just don't know. There's no prediction i can't go to the parent when the student when when the, when the student comes to me and says my mom and dad are really upset about me making this choice of being a music major or, or doing a career in music and there's no way to go to them and say look hey your son or your daughter you know um they're going to be here one day you can't predict that but you can say hey they have the talent if they work really hard then they could get to this level or they could get to this place so you just got to be positive and encouraging that and encourage that. And, um, you know, I've had students who I love. I had students who have been around uh, my whole life um, that um, didn't, it didn't work out, you know, at all. And I've had students that I thought were extremely talented that could go on to be huge. And then they get to that place and they go like, eh, I want to be an accountant. I wanted to be um, um, what recently was uh, one went back to, to school to do something else, you know, after completing a bachelor's degree in music and doing it for a while. And six, eight years later, they, they said, you know what, I'm going to go back to school to do something else, you know, and uh, some of them parlay that into, you know, another career and mm-hmm. another opportunity. And that's fine. You know, I want to just be happy, you know. I want to do my best for them and then them do their best and, you know, make good choices and, and be happy in life, you know? So I've told more than one person, if you've found your bliss, then stay with that because it's hard to come by. Absolutely. Um, Yeah. It's, it's the, the, to get to that place is, hard work it's a long journey sometimes but it's worth it when you get there i mean 
you know, I, I still, I walk around with a sense of thankfulness, you know, um, and positivity. And, um, you know, even in the bad times and the dark times and the, and the, the valleys, you know, uh, there's, 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 there's an essence of, uh, I can still see the sun, you know, I can still look up and, you know, as long as you keep that mentality of looking up and look for the, look for the light and that kind of thing. Yeah. Find that bliss, you know, and stay there. You know? <laughs> I think it's interesting too, because your story, I mean, you're still, you know, you're teaching and, and doing all that, but you're also still performing. I think your story also kind of showcases that even though you find that and you quote unquote, get there, you also still just work hard, right? Like you keep working hard. Yeah. It's yeah. that old notion of kind of that Zen story of, you know, uh, chop wood, carry water, right? Like you just, you keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah. You just got to, you, you know, you, you, you stamina, I go back to stamina again. I, 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 I get made fun of in a joke, in a jokingly way, sometimes by my friends of, how much patience and stamina I have, you know, like if I were you, I'd be so mad. I'd be like, okay, I'm, I'm upset. I'm not, <laughs> but there's no reason for me to, 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 you know, be mad and, and, and maybe destroy the whole thing. Um, there are times again that you walk away, you know, uh, you got to know when those times are, I think, and be smart about it and be, uh, have good judgment, but, Man, patience and stamina are good qualities to have, in my opinion. Um, you know, working with students can be very stressful and very, um, um, <laughs> uh, let me use the right word here. It's the word I just thought of. <laughs> Irritating. <laughs> um, you know, especially when you hear the same excuse, you know, so I, I mentioned that a lot, you know. Um, excuses are not in it shouldn't be in your vocabulary you shouldn't have an excuse um you know we want solutions you know we want to find a way like don't think of that okay that happened now how can you fix it how can you do something different um you know um yeah i i have so many stories and i i, I i'll leave it at this because i I don't want to say specifically, you know, because I don't want to call the student out. <laughs> but when a student comes to me and says something has happened and then turns that around and says, but here's what I'm going to do to mm -hmm. fix it. I love that. I absolutely adore, again, that kind of quality in a student or in a person, you know, mm -hmm. when they just don't like, oh, man, this, 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 and this happened and um, I can't, you know, uh, do it anymore or whatever, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I really, that's a, that's a quality right there, you know, that's important. And I teach myself all the time. That's the whole thing is to be teachable, you know, bend, you know, make, make yourself, you know, be a listener, you know, listen, you know, don't think you know it all. I don't know it all at all. I tell, uh, that's another thing I say to students a lot. Um, I don't know everything at all in fact it changes so much in the music industry mm. most of the time i don't know what's going on <laughs> and i'll say that and they'll be like what and i'll it, and i'll add though but i'm trained and smart enough to go find the answer mm. or to ask the question so don't think you know it all ask the ask the question or go find the answer um and they come to me with the question and if i say you know i don't know that but I will help you find it. That's my role. Uh, I can't just be the dictionary. There are a lot of people out there that expect that. They want that, you know, and you'll never achieve that. You never, never achieve that. And <clears throat> what would you say is the biggest takeaway from your story? Um, you know, experience. Um, looking at life in a positive way, you know, um, doing what you love, doing what you have passion. Again, I don't want to retire, you know, they're going to throw me, you know, in the ground, do, being a musician, you know, and hopefully having a great career. 
Um, and, you know, here's another thing. Generations. I want, a, I want to give for generations. Uh, I want my students, my relationships, my children, my actual children to have me for generations, to have that experience for generations. I want people, you know, 80 years from now to say, you know, some kid that I've never met in my life whose dad took guitar lessons from me and say, hey, this guy that taught my dad guitar was, was amazing. You know, just those kind of things. I want, I want generations of people to, you know, legacy basically, you know, so uh, build, build a real foundational legacy. You know, that's, that would be important you know, to me, you know, <laughs> and all my faults and, <laughs> and I, you know, all that stuff that's still, that, that stuff that's still there that you want to go like, oh, but you know, that one time, you know, uh, I, I want, I want people to, to look at that, look at me, you know, fondly and look at my career fondly. And hopefully I've helped them. And hopefully I've given them something that they've taken. Um, I actually had a student, student group of students, sorry, give me a video. Uh, they made a video for me last year. And that was one of the things that kept not just current students, but past students too, that kept coming up was, I just didn't learn music, you know, from him, you know, or they, they were, they were actually talking directly to me because they, because like, Hey, Dr. Tubbs, I want to, you know, tell you this story and thank you for everything you've done. And it kept coming up and it made me very emotional. Actually. I, I felt, uh, very, um, enriched by it. It was very heartfelt. How many of these students said, Hey, you gave me so much music identity you know, you gave me a musical identity, but you also taught me about life. You talked, talk, you talked a lot about uh, not just the music, but about how to be a human. You know, that was, that meant more to me than anything. I taught them how to be a human. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's quite a to leave, that's, that's for sure. It was a, po you know, a, a positive person, a, a, a contributing member of society with a, with ideas and uh, aspirations and, and, you know, art and everything. So that meant a lot to me. So yeah, that, those kind of things are important to me. Those, those generational effects of, of being good, you know, being good, good people doing good things all the time. I think that's a good place to end. Um, Dr. Tubbs, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. It was a wonderful story. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Thank you so much for having, having me. And um, I can't tell you uh, how appreciative I am to be on this with you guys. Well, thank you so much. The Path to Tilt is hosted by Kevin Harris and Lauren Tashman, created and produced by Kevin Harris. The content is copyrighted by The Path to Stilled, all rights reserved.